today's topic, we're going to be discussing human populations. Now remember, at the beginning of this class, we talked about the number one environmental problem is overpopulation. So this very, very fast growth of humans is responsible for all of our issues from climate change to water and air pollution to loss of biodiversity to everything that we're seeing today. And so I want to begin by talking about something called uh, population ecology. This is a branch of biology, a natural science, that deals with the numbers of a particular species, any species, doesn't have to be just humans, and why those numbers change over time. So let me give you one example of this. Right now, uh, biologists are, are looking at the population of the desert tortoise here in Nevada, and if you take a look at their numbers over the last 20, 30 years, they've unfortunately, the numbers have been steadily declining. So a population ecologist would study why. Why are desert tortoises numbers slowly decreasing over time? Now, really what we're going to focus on today is the second uh, study, something called demographics. And I know you've heard that word before. You hear it a lot in any election year. So the political parties want to know what demographics or what groups they appeal to and what groups they need work with. So for our purposes, we're going to define demographics as a, it's a branch of sociology, so a social science that solely studies the characteristics of human populations. So when we talk about demographics, we're solely talking about the things that we talked about on the first day of this class. Remember we talked about the three spheres of sustainability the environment, the economy, and the social system. Essentially, the social system includes all of these demographic features. Age, ethnicity, income, religion, political, sexual orientation. All of these are rolled up into demographics. And so that's really what we're going to concentrate on today. We're, we mentioned population ecology, but we're really concerned today with the characteristics of human populations and why our numbers have been dramatically increasing over time. Now, really when we talk about any species, looking at pure numbers tells us very, very little. Instead, what we want to know is something called population density. This would be the number of individuals of a particular species within a bounded given area. So we might talk about the population of coyotes or desert tortoises or black widow spiders within the Las Vegas Valley. So that's our bounded area. Now usually when we talk about population density, particularly when it comes to humans, we talk about people per square mile or people per square kilometer. The greater the population density, the more clustering of people there's going to be in that particular area. Now, we've already looked at this, guys. Remember when we talked about biodiversity and biomes, but different biomes uh, support different population densities. And we mentioned this before, Remember, as far as it comes to biodiversity, the greatest biodi biodiversity is going to be found at the equator. And as you go towards the poles, biodiversity decreases. So what we're going to see here is that equatorial areas, hot and wet, generally going to have higher population densities of all biological organisms. And polar areas are going to have low population density. This would be dependent on climate, the amount of resources available. All of these things are going to affect what the population density is. Now, let's take a look at the global population density. This is 2017 numbers. And so the countries that you, where you see the kind of uh, deep brown or dark maroon this is where we have high population density. So this would be 
um, the dark moon would be 1,500 to 9,000 people per square kilometer. And so what we generally see is we have high population densities here in, in Western Europe, a little bit over here, uh, and over here in China. And then you see the, the darker red, which is kind of the moderate to higher population density, India, uh, parts of Western Europe as well. If we look at the po low population density areas, Russia has a very low population density, Canada, even the southern part of South America and Australia have a low population density. And so it's not a uniform distribution. Certain countries like India, uh, China, Japan have fairly high population densities and other countries, Canada, US, Scandinavian countries have a fairly low population density. Now that's what the global picture looks like. Here's what the picture in the US looks like and this is based on the 2020 census data. Once again, the more maroon you are, the higher your population density. Now, unlike the last one, which was people per square kilometer, because the rest of the world uses the metric system, ours is people per square mile. And so you can see we have population centers here in the upper Midwest with Chicago, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Detroit, and the East Coast. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, for some reason people want to live in Philadelphia, not sure why. Um, Washington all have high population densities. And even the state where you go to die, Florida, has fairly uh, a couple pockets of high population density. Uh, you'll see once again some pockets in the uh, Plain states from Omaha to Houston, but then you get into to Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, uh, uh, West Texas, and you'll see very low population densities until you get to the West Coast. Uh, Seattle, Portland, uh, San Francisco, LA, San Diego, and even Las Vegas. We have a fairly um, higher population density than normal. And so once again, what I'm trying to get across here is it's not uniform, especially in the US. There are pockets where people tend to congregate. Um, climate, once again, um, urban versus rural, a lot of things um, come into play here. Now these are our population density trends through time, and this is by region. Um, the units here are people per square kilometer, because once again, that's the most common because the rest of the world uses the metric system. So if you look at Africa, they went from about 53 people per square kilometer in 1990 to a projection of almost 173 by 2050. So within the next 30 plus years, they're going to reach that level, which is more than triple their population density. In fact, if we look at it, this is where we see the highest growth is in our pre-industrial African countries. Uh, here's Australia in the Pacific from 67 people per square kilometer back in 1990 to not quite um, doubling it by 2050 to 123. Here's Europe and Asia, also an upward increase 141 to 211. Here's North America. Now notice the increase in North America is much, much slower. We've gone from about 26 people per square kilometer to a projection of 41. South America a little bit steeper. Here's the average over here, guys, the world. In 1990, it was about 77 people per square kilometer and almost, but not quite, going to double that by 2050 to 134. It, it doesn't matter the region but we're seeing an upward trend. Some are, are more steep than others, but population densities by region are going up. Now, when we look at populations through time, they're going to be controlled by two things or two factors. The first factor is the birth rate. This is simply the number of births within a population. Now this is gonna be based on something we're gonna talk about here in a minute called fertility rates. Usually countries that have high fertility rates also have high birth rates. And so this is, if you look over here, this is birth per 1,000 women. 
So the red or the brown color would be 45 plus offspring produced for every thousand women. The blue on the other hand would be zero to 10. Now if you look at this picture guys, and we're gonna talk about this later, how a country's industrial revolution um, drives growth we'll notice that what we call the industrialized world or the post-industrial world we have fairly low birth rates US Canada Western Europe uh, Russia Australia even China has fairly low birth rates what we tend to see is here in Africa the pre-industrial countries the countries that haven't and may never go through their industrial revolution this is where we see the high birth rates so uh, Central and South Africa, even parts of the Middle East, have fairly high birth rates. And we're going to talk about this later, how that is controlled by where a country is in their industrial development. Now, this birth rate is influenced by fertility rate. So let's talk about that now. Now, this is 2015 data the fertility rate is the average number of children that would be born to a woman over her lifetime so usually fertility rate is a little bit higher than the actual birth rate okay a woman um, let's say a woman has a, a fertility rate of six children but she only bears three of them so the fertility is simply this average number born to a woman over her lifetime and what we see is notice let me go back here so look at the birth rates again now let's look at the fertility rates notice that those countries that have high fertility rates also have high birth rates the countries that have much lower fertility rates have much lower birth rates so it's correlated here guys birth rate and fertility rate are correlated as one increases the other increases uh, and so notice the purple is seven to eight the dark blue is zero to one and so once again the post-industrial world has low fertility rates low birth rates the pre-industrial world has high birth rates high fertility rates now the birth rate is just one of those two factors that controls growth uh, actually, before we get to that, let's talk about fertility and ethnic group. So this was actually a study done in the U.S. that looked at fertility rate and ethnic group. So we have five ethnic groups. The brown line is Hispanic. Black line is uh, African Americans. The blue is Caucasians. Yellow is Asian. And then the red is Native Americans. And so you can actually see, this is through time, 1980 to 2013, you can see how fertility rates have changed. Uh, if you look at um, Asian and um, um, Caucasians, their fertility rates have been surprisingly level over time. Um, the Native Americans' fertility rate has actually decreased with time. Um, African Americans have increased and then decreased through time but what we see is of all the ethnic groups the Hispanic group has pretty much always had the highest fertility rate so if you look back in the early 90s it was about 2.96 so almost three children for every woman whereas in 2013 it, it had decreased a little bit to about 2.15 and so that there's a lot of factors that control this but religion is a big one think about Hispanics are mainly Catholics they don't believe in birth control and they don't believe in abortion so once you get pregnant pretty much you're going to have that child uh, there are also cultural aspects here as well think about it most Hispanic families are, are fairly large both immediate and kind of extended families if you grow up in a large family you're more likely to have a large family yourself because you grow up thinking that that's the norm and so religious and cultural aspects are, play a role in different fertility rates for different ethnic groups in the US now let's go back to what I was talking about we talked about um, 
a country's growth is dependent on two factors. The first one was the birth rate. The second one is the death rate. That should make sense. A population growth is going to de be dependent on how many people we add and how many people we subtract or how many people die. Now, here's the global death rate, and, and I love the color scheme they used here, guys. The, the really dark brown or black is where we have the highest death rates. So once again, this would be deaths per 1,000 people. The dark brown or black is, is 21 and greater. Now, notice you see the, the same correlation here, guys. The pre-industrial world, Central and South Africa, yes, they have some of the highest birth rates, but they also have some of the highest death rates. Because they haven't gone through their industrial revolution, they ha lack clean water, enough food, uh, proper sanitation, proper health care. All of these things tend to increase the death rate. Whereas the post-industrial world, U.S., Canada, Western Europe, Russia, um, Japan, Australia, we have fairly low death rates because we have access to good medicine, good health care good sanitation. All of these things play a role. Now, when we talk about population growth, it's important to bring up uh, Thomas Malthus, who lived in the 1800s. Um, Malthus was actual, actually studied economy, but during his studies, he actually proposed his ideas on population growth. Malthus said that if a population was left unchecked. A check is anything that slows growth down. So he said that if there was nothing slowing growth down, humans would increase at a geometric rate. Essentially we double. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. But Malthus noticed that food supplies only grow at a linear rate. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Five. Malthus was really the first alarmist that said that we were going to outgrow our food supply. Now, this hasn't happened yet. Malthus failed to take into account advances in agriculture, advances in technology. We've actually done a pretty good job of producing enough food for our entire population if it was distributed equally. There's the first problem, guys. Economic inequalities means millions of people still die from starvation because they don't have enough money to buy enough food. It's not that we don't produce enough. It's simply that economic inequality uh, hurdle. Now, that is not always going to be the case. In fact, uh, I am actually making this recording in the summer of 2022. We're getting fairly close, guys. Climate change is actually reducing the amount of agricultural um, square footage we have, agricultural yield, how much food we can produce. And we're actually starting to see today that we are starting not to be able to produce enough food for our growing population. So while Malthus sounded the alarm back in the 1800s, now we're really going to see that starvation malnutrition rate increase because climate change is driving down how much food that we can produce. And, and we're going to talk about that in our climate change discussion. One of the impacts is disruption to agriculture. We're seeing soil fertility decrease, which means we can't produce enough food that we could 40 or 50 years ago. Now let's go back to this, these checks. Malthus um, grouped his checks into two, um, two types. The first one he called positive checks. This is anything that increases the death rate. So disease, famine, war, good old-fashioned homicide. These would all be positive checks, okay? Notice, you increase the death rate, you're gonna slow down growth. The other one are preventative checks. This is anything that lowers the birth rate. Uh, abortion, birth control, family planning, um, even celibacy, choosing not to have sex. These would all lower the birth rate. 
It doesn't matter if you're lowering the birth rate or raising the death rate, both of them slow down growth. So there's always some check that tends to slow growth down. Now, he looked at this and Malthus concluded that the earth can only support so many people before it reached something that he dubbed the carrying capacity. This is the maximum population, maximum amount of people on Earth that can be maintained without degradation of natural systems. Now, we want to ask ourselves this question, well, have we reached carrying capacity yet? Well, ask yourself this, do you see degradation? Yeah, everywhere, guys. Most Earth systems are degraded because of human activities. And so, most scientists agree that we've already reached and surpassed carrying capacity. Now, there's still some argument as to when that was. Some may argue 5 billion, others may argue 6 billion, but we're coming up on 8 billion now, and most people agree we hit it and shot right past it. Now, when we talk about a country's growth, we need to talk about something called doubling time. And doubling time is just as the name implies. It's the amount of time it takes for a country's population to double in size. Now, we can actually calculate this according to the rule of 72. So the doubling time is equal to 72 divided by a country's growth rate expressed as a percentage. So let's say a country has a 2% growth rate. To calculate the doubling time, we take 72 divided by 2, and that would get us 36. So a country with a 2% growth rate would double in 36 years. Now, the higher the growth rate, the less time it's going to take to double. And so you can see these are the growth rates by country uh, for a five-year period from 2005 to 2010. And you'll notice, once again, the countries with the highest fertility rates, highest birth rates, have some of the highest growth rates and would therefore have some of the lowest doubling times. Now, I want to point out Russia and parts of Eastern Europe. They actually have a growth rate less than zero. So if we just look at this from a mathematical standpoint, could a country that has a growth rate less than zero ever double? The answer is no, okay? They simply, in the case of Russia and parts of, of Eastern Europe, uh, we're gonna talk about different types of growth, but those are countries that actually have been declining over time. And so there's no way they will ever double in size. Now, what I wanted to do now is I kind of wanted to take a journey and look at how the human population has changed through time and look at some of the things that have changed that have caused periods of growth. And so I want to start at 10,000 BCE. If you're not familiar, that BCE stands for Before Current Era. We actually used to use BC before Christ. Now we use Before Current Era. At about 10,000 BCE, we had about 5 million, homo, when I were talking about Homo sapiens, so modern humans, our population was at about 5 million. Now, it's right about this time that three things happen that really caused the first period of human growth. Okay, And so, on this graph, this is where we are right here. The first thing is, we invented agriculture. Second thing is, we began to domesticate animals. We, we um, bred animals for our use, okay, both eating and to work for us. Now, both of these things then caused this third change. Before this time, humans were nomadic hunting and gathering societies. So if you remember those, those large mammals, the woolly mammoths, the mastodons uh, of the last ice age, um, humans, that those animals would migrate depending on season, and so humans would have to travel um, and follow these herds for their food supply. 
Now let's look at this logically. If you have to constantly be on the move, do you want a big family or a small family? Well, you want a small family, right? Okay, to better keep up with those migrating large mammals. Now that we developed agriculture, now we could finally ditch the nomadic portion of our lives and settle in permanent cities or towns and grow our own food. And so these, those three things, invention of agriculture, domestication of animals, and that cultural shift caused the first period of human growth. So if we fast forward 5,000 years to 5,000 BCE, human population had reached 50 million. Now today, we can add 50 million relatively quickly, but back then, that was a pretty good growth. So here's where we are, 10,000 to 5,000 BC. Now you're starting to see that slight increase, very, very slow increase, but an increase nonetheless. Now, if we fast forward another 5,000 years to the dawn of the first millennium, okay, um, we were at 300 million. So 5 to 50 to 300 million in 10,000 years. So growth, but very, very slow growth. Now, it is about 1740, 1750, which is the beginning of our industrial revolution. So you'll notice that right here, everything leading up to our industrial revolution, yeah, it's slowly growing, now we're starting to see an increase, but after the industrial revolution, now look at human population absolutely take off. And that was really the triggering factor. Before the industrial revolution, the global population was slowly growing. After the Industrial Revolution, we grew um, exponential growth, where you add a lot of people in a relatively short period of time. So the Industrial Revolution, 1740, I, I usually use 1750 as kind of the boundary of before and after. So after 1750, our population absolutely takes off. Now we cross the 1 billion mark uh, at the beginning of the 17th century. 65% of the population is Asia, is in Asia, and less than 1% is in North America. And Asia has always had the majority of the global population. Now if we fast forward to 1927, we cross the 2 billion mark. And so I want to stop here guys and notice that remember and we talked about this homo sapiens we show up about 250,000 years ago it took us almost 249,000 years to add the first billion people it only took us 127 to add the second billion that's that exponential growth guys uh, we hit 3 billion in 1960, and uh, s several factors caused this. First off, we had the baby boom generation after World War II. So the 40s and 50s, we saw high birth rates, uh, increased growth. We also had medical advances, advances in uh, agriculture and sanitation. All of these things caused that growth after war that period of growth after World War II. Uh, 1974 we crossed the 4 billion mark and in 1999 we crossed 6 billion. Notice ladies and gentlemen that it took us 25 years to add 2 billion people and so right now on average it takes us anywhere between 11 and 12 years to add a billion people. Just think about that. Stop and think about that for a million. In another 11 years from right now, we'll have another billion people on this planet. Kind of disturbing when you stop to think about it. Now, here are snatches. Uh, every uh, couple of years, I, I uh, take a, a snapshot of where the global population is. And I've been doing this since I've been here at CSN back in 2009. So notice on January 5th, 2009, 
we were at 6,751,866,059. Uh, we crossed the 7 billion mark on Halloween of 2011, which I think is appropriate because it's scary how quickly we are growing. Uh, the, I actually, my last reading was about a week ago. On June 17th, 2022, we were at 7,954,533,800. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, well, the, all those deaths due to COVID really slowed our global population growth down. In fact, they really didn't. COVID was a small blip and we've pretty much recovered now that we have a, a, a vaccine and, and, and people are taking the vaccine. So believe it or not, it slowed, it slowed us down a little bit, but it really didn't slow us down a lot. Now, because I don't record these or re-record these lectures every year, um, obviously if you're, if you're uh, listening to this in 2025 or 2028 um, and you're curious what the global population is, check out the PowerPoint I have with this MP3 um, file. So I have an audio file and a PowerPoint. I, I tend to update the PowerPoint every six months or so. Or you can go to this great site called Worldometers. Worldometers has the current global population. They also have the current population of every single country in the world. So if you're curious what the population of China or Japan or the Congo is, go check out Worldometers. Great source for population growth. Now, I've also taken snapshots of where the population is in the US. So when this slide was made back in 2007, we had just passed 300 million in the US. And once again, you can see at several different times, uh, once again, last week, June 17, 2022, we were at 334 million. 735,315. Now, we are not displaying exponential growth, guys. The U.S. is a slow growth country. And we'll talk about the differences between rapid, slow growth, zero growth, and negative growth in a little bit. But the overall global population is growing exponentially. We are not. We're slowly growing as a country. And that's because we're in the post-industrial stage. We've already gone through our industrial revolution. Once again, if you're curious what the US population is, please go, go to Worldometers and, and you can see what it actually is when you look it up. Now, this is um, the, I guess I would say, the current population growth based on region. And so you can see, if you take a look at that, over half of the global population growth is uh, or was in Africa from 2000 to 2018. So they went from 817 and a half million in 2000 to 1.28 billion in 2018. Uh, you do see some fairly um, high growth in Asia. So this would include high population density countries of India and moderate population density countries of China. 21% uh, growth, so they went from 3.73 billion to 4.5 billion. We've also seen fairly good growth in South America, even Australia, although the numbers are lower. But look at Western Europe. Very, very slow growth, almost no growth, from 727 million to 742 million over that 18 year period. And then growth in uh, North America, this isn't just the US, this would include Canada, uh, Mexico, and parts of Central America as well. And so once again, 450 million to about 543 million. And so you can see, definitely, if we look, uh, over three-fourths of the global growth is in uh, Africa uh, or the Asian continent. Now, this is projections. So this is where we're heading. And these are three projections based on fertility rate. Remember, that's the average number of children that could be born to a woman over her lifetime. So if we look at this at a low fertility rate of 1.6, and I know a woman can have 0.6 of a child, but remember these are average numbers. So low fertility, 
Um, that has us hitting about 8 billion, which we've already surpassed, it back in 2035, 2040, and then declining. Most people think that this is not realistic, which is why we've already surpassed it. We also then, on the uh, upper end of things, the red line is high fertility rate of 2.6 children per women. This has us hitting about 9 billion by 2025, going all the way to 27 billion by 2150. I'm happy to say that most people think that that isn't realistically. Thank God, okay? 27 billion people in the next 130 years, that's n no good. So most people think that the purple line is reality, the median fertility of about 2.1 children. So this has us hitting about 9 billion by 2040. And uh, it, uh, this graph actually says about 11. That has that actually been projected upwards, guys. We now think that by 2150, we're going to be somewhere between 12 and 13 billion. So it's th this purple line should be shifted upwards. Now, you think things are bad now at almost 8 billion, guys. Let's add another 5 billion people and see if they improve. Okay, Climate change, water pollution, air pollution is only going to get worse the more people that we add. Now, here's the key concept, and I've, I've kind of been mentioning this um, already. But we want to talk about what something called demographic stages. A demographic stage is where a country is in regards to their industrial revolution. And there's four major stages. Pre-industrial, transitional, industrial, and post-industrial. Now this is going to have a big impact on growth because these stages control birth and death rates. And remember, those are the two factors that drive population growth. So let's start with our pre-industrial stage. This is a country that has yet to enter their industrial revolution. These are often the poor countries, guys. Once again, think of pretty much all, every country in Africa except out South Africa. South Africa is not pre, but Ethiopia, um, Egypt, Congo, Chad, Nigeria, these are all pre-industrial countries. Now, in a pre-industrial countries, birth rates are high, okay? Fertility rates would also be high, and death rates are high. However, the birth rates are usually higher than the death rates. So you'll have more deaths, but you generally have more births. And so countries in the pre-industrial stage are going to have moderate to high growth rates. They're really going to grow. Okay, Think about it, guys. We, we, we looked at this from a global perspective. And where did we see the highest birth rates and the highest population densities? In Africa, our pre-industrial countries. Now, the next one is the transitional. The transitional is kind of when a country is gearing up for their industrial revolution or just entering uh, industrial production. In this case, the birth rates stay high, but the death rates dramatically decrease due to better health care, better medicine, um, better uh, clean water, more food, uh, sanitation, all of these things cause a drastic decrease. But because the birth rates are still high, we're going to have high growth. So the first two stages are where we tend to have moderate to high growth. Now the industrial stage, this is when a country is firmly entrenched in their industrial revolution. The, the first part of the industrial stage birth weight rates will remain high. But as you progress, the birth rates slowly decline because women enter the workforce. They have less time for families and therefore they generally produce less offspring. So the middle to later stages of the industrial, we're gonna see a decrease in growth. 
So the death rates are still low, now the birth rates are starting to come down as well. And then post-industrial stage, now the birth rates and the death rates are going to be low. And another important thing happens in post-industrial countries, education becomes important. And generally as education increases in a country, birth rates decline. So there's that inverse relationship. Education becomes important, birth rates and fertility rates go down. Now, I want to give you examples of, of all these stages. So let's go back to the pre-industrial. I gave you all those African nations. Um, transitional and industrial, it's often hard to tell if you're in the transitional stage or the industrial stage. So let me give you the, the three best examples of countries currently in their industrial revolution. China, India, and Mexico. Okay. I'd also include Brazil. Brazil is also an industrial country right now as well. Okay. So generally it's hard to tell if you're in transitional or industrial, so I'll often lump those two together. And then post-industrial countries, once again, we think of Canada, the U.S., uh, Japan, most of Western Europe. So, you know, the U.K., France, Spain, um, all of those are post-industrial countries. Australia would be another example of post-industrial. So we've already looked at how birth rates and death rates um, change from country to country. That's because of these industrial stages have a play a big role in determining growth. Okay, So we're going to see the biggest growth from pre-industrial to kind of the middle of the industrial. That's where most of the growth is going to take place. Now, I, I, I show this slide and I have a, a, I disagree with this a little bit. This actually has birth rates and death rates as the same. I disagree with that. So it actually has growth stagnant, okay? So I would actually, instead of this straight line, I would actually kind of put the line like this, where you're seeing growth, 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 kind of until the middle of the industrial stage and then we start to see this leveling off okay so birth rates death rates high here's the transitional stage where you start to see the big decline in death rates here's the industrial as women enter the workforce the birth rates decline as well so once again so we're going to see growth 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 through pre growth through transitional growth in the first half of the industrial and then you start to see this leveling off okay where the birth rates and death rates are low and education becomes important in the post-industrial stage now in order to be able to predict growth of a country we need to know something called the age structure now this is a distribution of a country's people by both age and gender and we have four different types of age structures. Rapid growth, slow growth, zero growth, and negative growth. Now, here are the, the four visual representations down here. Notice male is on one side, female is on the other, and then we have three groups. This is 14 and younger, so children. The yellow is 15 to 44, that's kind of the sweet spot for reproduction and then the um, orange is 45 and above, usually beyond reproductive age. Now, notice in the rapid growth country, we have a lot of children, high fertility rates, high birth rates. We also have a large amount of the population that's in that reproductive sweet spot, which is why we have so many children. Now, if you take a look at examples here, Guatemala, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia. I'm going to skip Saudi Arabia because it doesn't make my point here, guys, but Guatemala and Nigeria are both pre-industrial countries. Typically, um, pre-industrial, transitional, and industrial countries tend to be rapid growth. So this is what their age structure will look like. Once you reach the post-industrial phase, then you'll you will be represented by one of these three. You'll be slow growth, you'll be zero growth, or you'll be negative growth. Okay, So these are the countries where most of the growth is going to occur. 
Now in slow growth, notice the amount of children has dramatically decreased and the amount of people beyond reproductive age has increased. So we're still growing, but it's slow, okay? As I said, we are a slow growth country as is Australia and Canada. Once again, what do all three of those have in common? Post-industrial countries. Now here's zero growth. Zero growth, remember in evolution, we talked about maintaining a population. It's not growing, it's not decreasing, it's staying the same through time. That's zero growth, okay? And in this case, notice, once again, less children, more people in the beyond reproductive age. And so you're simply maintaining the amount of people that are born equals or approximately equals the amount of people that die. And then last, we have negative growth. In this case, um, you have a country's growth numbers actually decline over time. Notice how small the f 0 to 14 age is, very, very little children, and most of your population, um, maybe upwards of 40 to 50 percent, are beyond reproductive age. Uh, Germany, Bulgaria, and Sweden, once again, are all post-industrial countries. I'd also include Russia in there as well, guys, are negative growth countries. Their populations have been decreasing through time. Now, let's talk about some other factors that affect population growth. Um, migration. So, uh, immigration with an I would be people entering a country. Immigration with an E are people leaving a country. So obviously, if you, if you have a lot of people coming in, you're, you're going to have higher growth numbers. If you have a lot of people leaving, this is you're going to see slower growth. Uh, wealth. Now, here's an interesting thing here. There's an inverse relationship between wealth and birth rates. Okay? Usually, the first characteristic we use to measure wealth is GDP, gross domestic product. So post-industrial countries, wealthier countries, have a high GDP. They're also going to have a low birth rate. Whereas the poorer nations, Ethiopia's, the Nigeria's that have a low GDP, these have high birth rates. So there's that inverse relationship between fertility rates and birth rates and wealth. And education also plays a, a point. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but think about it. If you're a child in a post-industrial country, your parents expect you to go to school. And so, once again, as education becomes important, birth rates generally decline. So, once again, another inverse relationship. Both wealth and education, as they increase, the birth rates of that country tends to decrease. Now, let's finally get to um, the major issue we've been building to which is overpopulation now once again remember what the triggering factor was the industrial revolution so 1750 before that we were slowly growing as a world after that it's been exponential growth add a lot of people in a relatively short period of time remember nowadays 11 to 12 years is all it takes to add a billion people billion with a B. Now remember, we just looked at this where we think we're heading using that median fertility rate. Global population is expected to hit 9 billion by 2040 and somewhere between 12 and 13 billion people by 2150. Now remember, on the first day of class, I talked about one of the most important topics of environmental science, which is sustainability meeting the needs of today without compromising the needs of tomorrow. Well, you have to ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen, how can we keep this up? We're struggling to be sustainable now with only 8 billion people. It's only going to get worse the more people we add. Climate change is only going to get worse. Pollution is only going to get worse. Loss of biodiversity is only going to get worse. Um, water and energy shortages are only going to get worse the more people that we add. And so overpopulation is this really key concept of environmental science. Now, 
what I want you to do, and, and I'm actually going to offer you a chance of extra credit here. So um, one of your extra credit discussions, I am going to ask you to propose three solutions to the overpopulation issue. And so, you know, you can talk about whatever you want, some potential solutions. Remember, China had that one child policy that they've actually gotten rid of. Um, that would be a potential solution. Uh, birth control, uh, sex education, these all might be examples of how we can slow down this overpopulation problem. But I, I want to get your opinions on this, and I want you to go into detail. So, like with all extra credit discussions, you're going to need to do some research online to back up your um, opinions with cited information. But that will be available in the Canvas shell some sometime. Either uh, I've already posted it, or I will post it uh, within the next month or so. So think about that, potential solutions to the overpopulation issue. Now, here's this exponential growth, okay? These are often called uh, exponential curves or J curves because they look just like a J. So once again, remember 1750, that's kind of the, the boundary between slow growth before and then this exponential growth. So you can actually see uh, the years that we hit each of these billions. So 1800, we hit one. Um, 1930, I think I gave you 1932, we hit two. 60, 74, uh, 2011, we hit seven. We're projected to hit eight, 2024. It might even be next year, 2023. And then nine billion by 2043. Now, there is a cultural influence on overpopulation, whether you realize it or not. Now, we've talked a little bit about culture. Culture is just the values and norms of a society which are dependent on things like religion, education, and even moral and ethical beliefs. Your parents raised you with a certain set of rules for what's right and what's wrong. Now. A child in the United States is going to have a completely different uh, moral and ethical belief system than somebody that's raised in China or somebody that's raised in Japan. So each country has their own culture. Now, let's look at the overpopulation issue um, based on culture. And let's look at the pre-industrial countries, guys, often what are called the developing parts of the world. So let's look at Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, what do they look at their children? Uh, what do they want their children to do? They want them to work, right? And so in order to grow their economy, in order to increase their GDP, and hopefully one day go through industrial revolution, they need more children. More children means a bigger workforce, which means more money coming in, right? Doesn't that make sense? And so the pre-industrial world, they look at their children as their workforce. And that's why they have such high fertility rates and high birth rates. Whereas the post-industrial world, let's look at us here in the U.S., guys, the developed nation. What do we expect our children to do? We expect them to go to school. Okay. And so that is going to cause a decrease in the fertility rates and the birth rates. And so simply from a cultural standpoint, how we look at our children, whether as part of the workforce or to get educated, plays a huge role in affecting fertility rates and birth rates, okay? I don't know about you, but when I turned five, my mom didn't hand me a lunch pail and say, go get a job, you big mooch. That's not how we look at our children in this country. And so those cultural differences play a huge role in determining growth. Now, let's take a look at that exponential curve again, guys. But now let's, let's bring out the differences between the post-industrial world, the yellow, and the pre-to-industrial portions of the world, the green. 
And notice, this is a projection of 2050, saying a little bit over 10 billion. Notice that 85% of the global population estimate there is going to be in the developing countries, the pre-industrial, the transitional, or the industrial parts of the world. That's where we see highest fertility rates and highest growth rates. So it really isn't countries like the Western European countries or Japan or the US or Canada where we're seeing this major exponential growth. It's the other portions of the world, the poorer portions of the world, the poorer countries that are really contributing the most to the overpopulation issue. Now, let's talk about problems caused by overpopulation. And technically, we've been talking about this and we will continue to talk about this this entire semester. Remember, any environmental problem that you can name, I can link it back to the overpopulation issue. So, climate change, loss of biodiversity, pollution, species extinction, um, water and food shortages, all due to exponential growth of humans. Okay, And so every issue that is facing us today is a direct result of overpopulation. So this is by no means an exhaustive list here, guys, but some of the major things facing us, shortage of food supplies. So Malthus, remember, was the first alarmist to say we were going to run out of food. While that hasn't happened yet, it's ra the day is rapidly approaching that agriculture will fail to keep up with our population growth. Uh, exploitation of limited natural resources. We're running out of potable water, fossil fuels, minerals. And then remember, guys, we'll talk about this more later when we get to waste and waste disposal. But whenever we consume a natural resource, I don't care what it is, okay? Remember, we bring a natural resource into an economy, it becomes natural capital. As soon as we consume that natural capital, food, water, wood, whatever, we produce waste. That waste escapes into the environment and causes contamination or pollution concerns. The more we consume, the more waste we produce, the worse the problem becomes. Now, here are just some of the problems caused by overpopulation. This is population and world hunger. So the colors represent the amount uh, undernourished. So the countries that you see there in Central and Southern Africa, you're talking about 35% of the population doesn't get enough food every single day. Once again, going back to that economic inequality problem. Here is a uh, freshwater scarcity within the next uh, 13 years. And so they actually define, um, there's something called physical scarcity. That's mean not enough actual water. And they also have what is called economic scarcity. That means they don't have enough money to buy enough potable water for their population. So notice that once again, if we go back to Africa, our central and southern regions, you're talking about major economic water scarcity. So they simply don't have the economic resources to buy enough potable drinking water for their population. The red that you see, e look at even here in the US guys, especially in the arid southwest, which, uh, and once again, this climate is being exacerbated by climate change, but here, parts of northern Africa, the Middle East, even into parts of India and China, they have a physical water scarcity. So they simply don't have enough physical water to supply to their populations. And then you have the pink, um, which is getting close to physical water scarcity. Now take a look at some of these countries, guys, or, or some of these regions, the Middle East, India, um, China, uh, the southwest US, you're talking about large population densities, large centers of population that are either they don't have enough economic resources to buy water or they don't have enough actual water to use. And this is a frightening trend, especially here in the US. We'll talk about this when we get to water resources, guys, but I know you've all seen the the 
um, horrible situation that's going on in Lake Mead and how quickly Lake Mead is dropping and remember that supplies us with with our potable water here in the valley uh, here's oil shortages so each of these regions uh, that you can see here Russia Europe US Venezuela Nigeria um, the mid mid east or even other parts these are countries that have major oil producing capacities now it is generally agreed that we reached peak oil production somewhere around 2010 and we're on the back end now so we have more people but we have less oil for their use and so this drives up price and, and we get hit particularly hard at the the gas station uh, here is my biggest concern is our landfills and, and we'll talk about this when we get to waste but if you just take a look at that picture guys uh, about half or a little less than half of what we throw out and what ends up in landfills are things that can be recycled but we either choose not to do it or it's simply cheaper to throw it away than it is to recycle now remember all of this waste escapes into the environment and causes pollution whether we're talking about water pollution in those top pictures or whether we're talking about air pollution in those bottom pictures all a result of consumption the more resources we consume the more waste we produce and the worse our environmental degradation becomes now that is the end of our human population discussion once again be on the lookout for that extra credit discussion uh, I think the overpopulation problem and solutions to that is a very important topic and so be on the look for that um, you can do that as your extra credit uh, discussion assignment